if you ask me why I went and became an engineer, I thought I'm going to get a good job and make a good living. But at the age of 39, 40, I really discovered a different path of looking inwards and asking yourself and introspecting and what do I want out of life? Like if you remove all constraints, right, and you ignore the fact that you have uh, a wife, three kids, a mortgage and uh, a lot of responsibility (laughs) for a second, what do I want? Because the only true limited resource in the world that you have is time. Yeah. It's nothing else. People think it's about money, about fame and fortune. It's not. It's about doing what you want to do. And this this beautiful concept that I found in philosophy called the central purpose, how do you discover that? We spend so much time defining a company's vision and mission, and we don't think for a day about what is our own personal vision and mission. Welcome to the Talent Grow Show where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Hey, hey, talent growers. Welcome back to another episode of The Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. Talent Grow is the company I founded in 2006, and it's the company that sponsors this show to keep it free for you every Tuesday. And what we do is develop leaders that people actually want to follow. So this week on the show, I have a leader who has been a leader in a lot of different kinds of organizations, in different cultures, in different cities, in different countries. And he shares a really unique perspective based on his own professional journey and a lot of insights that he has gained from a process that he'll describe of introspection and recognizing what you actually value. And then how do you connect your employees, help them connect with what they value, and then finding that beautiful, juicy intersection between your needs and their values and putting them in the exact place that allows them to maximize value creation. This show is a little bit more philosophical than typically, but I think that that is a huge value to sometimes stop what we do, get a little bit away from the tactical and really reflect on our philosophy and what's guiding us. So I hope that you enjoy this show and I look forward to hearing what you thought afterwards. Let's take a listen to my conversation with it's funny. Talent Growers, Talent Fani is here. He is the president and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. He has been an entrepreneur, investor, and executive in the software world. He has built and grown successful teams and businesses in Israel and in the United States. And Tal is the co-founder of the Ayn Rand Center in Israel. And Tal and I met a long time ago, actually, in a couple of different scenes and environments. And I've watched him over time develop his organization and exercise his leadership skills. So I'm really excited to have Tal on the show today to share some of that with us. Tal, thank you for joining us on the Talent Grow Show. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Haleli. How are you? I'm excellent, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Before we get started, though, I always ask my guests to describe their professional journey very briefly. Where did you start, and how did you get to where you are today? I started as an SAT tutor back in Israel and that started at the bottom of uh, the largest Israeli private education company, and four years later, I was the CEO at a very young age. Wow. Yeah. And then we sold that company to Kaplan. And then I moved on to tech. I actually uh, was in tech training. I was the VP sales and marketing for a, a big company in Israel. And then uh, I was I was headhunted into a software company to lead the training organization. Then they moved me into a high potential program and told me, oh, no, you need to, uh, you have to get into software itself. So uh, they moved me to the U.S. Uh, in 2006, into Atlanta, Georgia, where I live today. And uh, I became a VP of a 20,000 people company, a software company called Amdocs. And then after reading a very important book in my life, I decided to venture on my own and joined a startup company with a relative of mine. We grew it to about 250 people and then sold it last year. And then I decided to, to make a, a really uh, interesting move. And uh, now I'm uh, CEO and president of a non 
non-profit organization, which is a very different environment, but in a way very similar. So that's where I am today. Yeah. And it's really interesting to me because obviously you have had a journey that is very rich. You know, you're, you're not that old and you've done so much over that time. And so much of that has been in a leadership role. And also in a lot of different cultural situations in different countries, in different types of organizations, in different right. sizes of organizations. So I want to actually just dig into that a little bit. What do you think are some of the key leadership lessons or tips that you found that transcend the cultures? Like what are some of the things that are constant regardless of the national culture or the organizational size or type? Mm -hmm. And what are some things that you think are really different in these different contexts? I mean, I know there's probably a million, but if you can focus on, on a couple, that would be so helpful. I think people are people. And well, the first thing you need to understand that everything around you is a market of values, both internally and externally. You're selling values to your customers in the, in the shape of a product or a service, but also your employees. They get a lot of satisfaction, a lot of pride for working for a cause and doing productive work. So in a way, we're in the market of values and what you, what you need to make sure it's an environment of positive values. I would say, yeah, it's very different to work for a 20,000 people company or two people in a room and then growing it to five people and 10 people. It's a very different dynamics. But all in all, you're trying to create value. That's the way I think about it. You know, from a leadership specifically, when you're leading people, it's a, it's a very different responsibility than just executing on something. When you're leading people, there's a whole different dimension. I call it being on the balcony. You know, you yeah. have the responsibility not to just dance on the dance floor with everyone and do and be in the, in the doing. But also you have the unique responsibility to go up on the balcony and look ahead, see what's going on, what's moving in what direction, both in the company, outside the company, and lay a vision because people that are fighting the, in the battlefield need to trust you. Do you know what they're fighting for and for what cause and in what direction and why are we doing what we're doing? You always answer the why. If it's very clear why we're doing what we're doing and they trust you and they sign up for the mission, then I think the foundation is there to create a, a wonderful culture of partnerships and teamwork that is working towards an inspiring vision. So I spend a lot of time on the why. Why are we doing things? A lot of time on planning, on get, making sure that everybody, again, from their own value system is aligned with what you're trying to achieve, what the company is trying to achieve. And we, we talk about it and we discuss it and what it means for everyone. What will the world look like if we're successful? And when you lay that vision, everybody gets excited and they bring their own system of values to that mix. And that's the wonderful thing about people, right? Everybody's different. So I try not to put people into buckets. I try to manage every person as their own unique persona and really always trade with them value for value, whether the are they bringing to the to the table? What are, the, are their strengths? What are their aspirations? And try to give them the best environment to, to thrive. That's my philosophy of, of uh, leadership. Well, I love that. And I totally share that philosophy. That's one of the reasons why <laughs> I enjoy being friends with you because you think uh, very much like me in that way. So I heard in your description there that vision is something that is a constant, a leadership constant, regardless of the organization. Have you found any maybe even surprising challenges where, hmm, this is not the same here as it was in my other organization along the transitions you've made with these different kinds of cultures? Oh, yeah. There's so many different dimensions. Every time it starts with, are you selling a product or are you selling a service? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it continues with what type of market you're in. Who are you competing with? To give you a little example, when we started our the startup, we were selling to small, medium businesses. And it's a kind of one-to-many relationship. So you're all about creating a wonderful digital experience where customers find you on the web and they find your software and they sign up and they start a trial and then they convert and everything's great. And we grew to like 7,500 customers. We thought we're going to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. and, th and then we hit the mid-market and those are bigger companies. So suddenly you need to talk to them and sell them and they have requests. They want your software to do this and it doesn't do this. So we, you know, we continue to grow, but then we hit the enterprise market, the big companies. And that was a, a really a learning experience of how different uh, you need to approach everything, the culture, the internal culture, the sales structures, the, the whole attitude towards customers and the way you build your product completely changed on us. 
And this is why we, uh, at the end of the day, we decided to sell the company because we didn't have the DNA of a company to continue to grow into the enterprise market. And we thought it's going to be a better opportunity to sell it to a company that is already there. So environments really dictate what needs to happen inside your organization. Because again, you're all about offering value to the environment. And if your customer is saying, no, I want a software that has more security in it, and it's going to be longer sales cycles because I want to make sure that everything is covered. It's not like the small moms and pops shop can, that, that can make a decision and pay you, I don't know, $150 a month. I'm going to pay you maybe $100,000 a month, right? So it's a whole different ballgame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I learned to be very open-minded and very agile, as they say in the Silicon Valley, yeah. uh, to understand that your, your world can change at any given moment. and You have to adjust to it. Uh, that's the beauty of, of our reality. It's so complex, it's so dynamic, and nothing works the same way over time other than very fundamental principles, right? You have to change. There's the book, by the Intel CEO, Andy Grove, called Only the Paranoids Survive. And in a way, <laughs> you know, it's, it, he's right. You always have to be on the lookout. It's what's going to change on me? Even one person leaving your team, another person joining the team can completely change the dynamics of a team. Yeah, Things it's like true. That. Yeah. 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 And then it catches you off guard if you're not really on the lookout always. Right. Hopefully not in a paranoid way, but just <laughs> in an observant way, in a weird yeah, way. Yeah, that's, he yeah. Was, he was put, <laughs> using the word paranoid. Just, just yeah, You have to always be on the lookout, of course, from yeah. a positive perspective. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. So speaking of a positive perspective and the philosophy, there is definitely a way in which one's philosophy guides one's decisions and approach mm-hmm. to life and approach to career. And you have recently done a series of webinars and and I was happy to watch one of the iterations of it about discovering and pursuing your central purpose. And I also know that you are very focused on philosophy, obviously, in the type of work that you do where you lead a a center that is all about a philosophy. I want to ask you from two different perspectives, one from a personal perspective about, you know, how do you discover and pursue your own central purpose? Just like in a business, you have a vision that you help people understand. And then maybe from a leadership perspective, so these are two different questions and you can take them in whichever order you prefer. From a leadership perspective, what are some other big mistakes that are philosophical mistakes that you see leaders are making that we can avoid or overcome? So from personal and from a leader perspective. Yeah, from a personal perspective, the reason why I'm so passionate about it is that I really had to go through a very profound process of rediscovering my central purpose for 40 years. I was a pretty successful business person and a, a leader. Um, you know, I was doing pretty well. But I can't say that I was jumping out of bed every day. I got into software because it was a good way to make money. But if you ask me why I went and became an engineer, I thought I'm going to get a good job and make a good living. But at the age of 39, 40, I really discovered a different path of looking inwards and asking yourself and introspecting. And what do I want out of life? Like if you remove all constraints, right, and you ignore the fact that you have a wife, three kids, a mortgage, and a lot of responsibility <laughs> for a second, what do I want? Because the only true limited resource in the world that you have is time. Yeah. It's nothing else. People think it's about money, it's about fame and fortune. It's not. It's about doing what you want to do. And this, this beautiful concept that I found in philosophy called the central purpose, how do you discover that? We spend so much time defining a company's vision and mission, and we don't think for a day about what is our own personal vision and mission. Mm-hmm. What is the one sentence that describes me and what I want to achieve in life? And that's a very hard process to do. It took me about a year and a half to figure out, to put in words what I am about, what Tal is about, what I want to achieve. That sentence, when I look at it every day, I get excited. I get, I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. And it, it was a very painful process. I had to let go of a lot of assumptions that I I've had about myself. It requires a lot of introspection. Mm-hmm. The, at the end of it, I came out with a lot of clarity of what I want to do. So um, I decided to take a nonprofit organization. I decided to write a children's book. I decided to focus on creating content. And one of them was the seminar that I did that you saw and focus on this process of discovering central purpose. And I think that's to connect that to the more professional aspect of it. I think leaders need to understand that, you know, when I say the word philosophy, people think about Greek people, Greek, you know, old <laughs> ancient Greek people in, in, in togas, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what philosophy is all about 
is understanding the principles that govern the human mind and the relationship of the human mind with reality. And that's like the physics of everything. And if you don't understand how you work and how the world works and the relationship between those two, your consciousness and the world, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you're going to spend a lot of time not being happy. So the one thing that I see now that I reflect back on my career and I see other people around me is that they don't identify core principles of what is governing their environment. And the reason why I started with values is because if somebody told me when I was 25 or 27, it's about everyone around you is looking for specific values. You have to discover what they're looking for because we're all seeking values in order to achieve them. And the result of successfully pursuing your values is the state of happiness and self-esteem that you gain from it. And that's what we're all about. We're all playing the same game. We're trying to achieve values. Now, the question is, are those rational values or not? That's, that's a very personal thing. But in order for you to understand your environment, you have to know what the people around you are looking for. Let's say if you take a salesperson, you start with questioning the person uh, across the table. It's, well, what do you want? What are you looking for? You know, you don't come with your assumption that they want your product. And that really plays to the psychology of all of us, which is, what are you really looking for? And if you have a lot of clarity of what you're looking for, then you're going to succeed. I'll give you an example. Like, everybody thinks, yeah, it's okay to get promoted and manage more, pe- manage more people. It's not true, right? Some people are miserable when they're leading a team, and they're very happy when they're uh, individual contributors, right? Yeah. So when I talk to people, not just managers, you know, people around me, it's just, what are your values? Discover them. It's not innate in you. It's not something that you just feel, you know, I feel like I like it or not. Feelings are great indicators uh, and evidence to what your consciousness is, is attracted to. But there's just that. There's just evidence. The true reason is something you have to go deeper to into an introspective, why you like what you like doing. So now that I have this prism, now that I have this, this, the, those glasses, those philosophical glasses, everything is much clearer to me. And I know that if I'll go back and manage another team, I'll do it in a much more effective way. And, I, you know, if you ask me about mistakes, it's just not understanding what people are about. And that's, that's I think, what's most important as a manager to identify. Talent growers know that I often ask my guests to help us concretize stuff and just make it super actionable. So you described a process that you went through personally, and you said it took you a year and a half or something like Mm -hmm. this for introspection. I mean, that by itself just sounds like what? For a year and a (laughs) half? How do you you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so how did you do it? I mean, did you journal? Did you just sort of put on your toga and stare into the night sky? I mean, wait, I'm being facetious, but what what did you do? (laughs) Well, that sounds good to put a toga and look at Yeah, the, the, just get a margarita and you're set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I call it the three good things method. What I, I mean by that is it doesn't matter if you want to do it on a daily basis or a weekly basis. I wouldn't do it more than that. But you sit down and you write on paper with a pen and paper. No, don't type it into the computer because it's something about writing it on paper that slows you down and calms you. And you write, what was good about this week? What did I enjoy? Sometimes you come to that journaling process with, I know exactly what I want to talk about, or I have a problem that I want to clarify. So it's okay to not just write about three good things that happened and why, but also answer questions. So sometimes I would start with, why am I feeling anxious? So to give a concrete example, so yeah, I I was journaling almost on a daily basis when I felt like I need to clarify for myself, what am I looking for? What is the next thing I want to do with my life? And I remember I had to make that decision if to leave a big company and, and join a small company. And I was super anxious. And I started writing and journaling, why am I anxious? The first thing that occurred to me, I don't know what anxious means. What is that feeling that I'm feeling? So I, I, I did some, yeah, it's, it's kind of a fear of something of the unknown. What's going to happen? And I said, what am I afraid of? What's going to happen? And then I started writing, okay, so I'm not going to make the same salary that I'm making today and I might not be able to afford the things. That's a good reason to get concerned. It gave myself a lot of empathy. And then I relaxed a little bit. And then I answered myself rationally. I said, put some money aside and, and, you know, worst case scenario, go back to to the company that you want to leave. They'll, They'll take you back any day. So there's no real danger here. So why are you so afraid? It's amazing. In like two, three weeks, the anxiety went away. It was really clear to me what I needed to do. There was no hesitation to leave that company and move to two people in a room with no salary, which which sounds really frightening. 
Yeah, but that's what a, a startup of, is, huh? Exactly. And but but with a lot of introspection, everything becomes clear. You learn to love yourself, you learn to value yourself, and you just unpack those feelings. And then you go back to that journal and you read, and it's so inspiring to see you your your thinking process evolve on paper. It just made me a much clearer thinker. And the best outcome is to become a valuer of life. By that I mean you know exactly what you love, you know what exactly what you don't like. And you try to surround yourself with the things you like and get away from the things and the people you don't like and the environments you don't like. So I would say that, well, that is the, I can't tell you how beneficial and rewarding it is. I know it sounds a little weird to do this self psychoanalysis and introspection. I'm not talking about meditation and not talking about relaxation. It's hard work. You sit down and trying to solve the riddle. Why am I feeling anxious? Or what do I do with that person? How do I solve this problem? Or why did I like this deal so much? I'll give you another big example that really clicked for me. So I closed a big deal for my, for my startup. And I came back. I was so excited about it. That, and I wrote it down. Why am I so excited about closing that deal? And I realized that what was different about that deal is that they told us, we saw the demo of your software and Microsoft software. It's both great. You both qualified. You're the finalists. But what will determine who's, who we're going to buy from is just a, a presentation of your vision of their, your company and your software and, and the others. I created a whole narrative. I wrote a story about a day in a life for that people's salesperson if they use our software. They wake up in the morning. What do they do? It was a beautiful story. It was funny. It was exciting. And it really covered all of the benefits of our software. And then the Microsoft guy just came in with a couple of slides and was really boring. And we won mm. the deal. And what was and when I sat down, I thought it was the million dollars that we want, but it was not. It was my love for storytelling. It was my love for writing narratives. It was my love of being on stage and talking to people and affecting it. And then I said, it's not about the software. It's about the narrative. That's what I love. That's where the, the, the arrow is pointing. And that's what you get out of introspection. You just uncover deeper layers of who you are and what you love about this world. And I think that's very important. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, man, I want to talk to you for a lot longer. And we don't have a lot longer. But I want to ask you another question in a similar vein to the one I just did, because that was really helpful, the way that you gave those examples. And you said that as a leader, you have to help people connect to value in the world of philosophy, you would say you want to be a trader, right? Uh, mm -hmm. the, the trader principle, which means that you're in every relationship you have, you are always trading value for value in a way that is free. You are free to mm -hmm. choose whether the value I offer to you is a value you seek. And therefore, in our interactions, we're always equals in the sense that whatever I value, I get from the interaction, whatever you value, you get from the interaction. And it's each of us thinks differently about what values are important. But in the end, we can trade in a way that makes us both feel like winners. So as a leader, to understand who each person is as an individual, do you have a way to quickly share with us how you did that or how you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, I can start with the way I interview people. I have a very different way to interview people. I, I may make it very personal and I go for what are you looking for? What are you trying to achieve? And I can give you examples of I was hiring a software engineer and, and he said, do you know, if you, if you really insist, what I really want to do in, with my life is build bridges. And I asked him why. He said, I'm just fascinated with bridges. I know every type of bridge in the world. I have books and books about bridges and how to build them. You know, at the end of the day, I didn't hire him, but I convinced him to go <laughs> switch uh, professions and go back to university and, and learn how to build bridges. Wow. And the reason why I, I really try to understand what's motivating that person. Everybody is a genius at something. And in many cases, it's not what they're doing for you in that company. Right? Maybe they're on the path to something they really want, and they see that as a step forward, which is a good thing. Maybe they're really excited about, about being you in 20 years, right? which is a good thing. But in many cases, I don't hire people that are very, like their resume is amazing, because their passion lies somewhere else. And I know at one, it's, a, it's, like, it's an inevitable. It's a, like a collision course. They're going to crash into something. Mm -hmm. So I try to really get to the bottom of what they are about, what they're trying to achieve, what's important to them, what do they do, what are their hobbies, how do they spend their time where they don't have constraints. So I do that. And uh, you know, that's how I, again, I, I said something about respecting the sovereignty of everyone's on their own mind. 
And I really respect everyone's sovereignty on their own mind. I really try to understand what they're about because you don't really manage people. They manage themselves, mm -hmm. right? You try to give them the environment to manage themselves very effectively because they know what they're doing, why they're doing what they're doing, and they're passionate about it. You talked about a voluntary environment that is respectful of who you are and your free will, right? And that's, that's I think, what is the essence of a great culture that you can create. And I learned a lot, by the way, in the Silicon Valley because it, it, it is uh, what you learn there. It's just you feel free to do, to experiment. You, you know, Google gives you time and money to experiment with things you want to do. It's such a great idea to, uh, we use at, at, at my company, Base CRM, to give, you know, a budget. You take $100 a month, you do whatever you want with it. We don't, you know, it has to be work-related. Mm -hmm. And people said, what? what? What would I do with it? I don't know. You figure out. And people did amazing things with it. They improved our software. They found a way to, to embed new ideas, you know, new equipment, and uh, people would share their experiences. Just, you know, let people drive themselves to wherever they want to drive themselves. And you give them an, a, a playground that is free for them to, to play in. They will create amazing things. So, yeah, that's, that's the way I look at it. In every employee, every person I work with, I see a genius. Now, the question is, can you help them discover the genius in them and what they want to achieve? And, and yeah. I, I love that. And also recognizing that sometimes this is not the place for that kind of genius. Like, it's yeah, not... Exactly. Yeah, it's not like yeah. oh, everybody's welcome to do whatever they want here. Mm -hmm. um, I hear in your story that while you honor and respect and appreciate every person's genius, also as a leader, what you're looking for is that match, you know, that value exchange that creates a win-win trade. Right. And let me be clear, I'm, I'm ruthless when it comes to people that are just not in the right environment. I just, I just like, look, you're not going to work here, here anymore, and I think it's going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. And here's what I see. The reason why it's not, you're not compatible to this environment is that either you're looking for other things or you have issues. And I would always have long discussions. We always, people are very afraid from that very tough discussion of letting someone go. Yeah. I see it as an opportunity mm -hmm. to give someone something very meaningful. It's like there is a reason why I think you should be working here, right? And of course, assuming that it's not because you're closing a company or something. Yeah. But I always pride myself with the fact that people that I let go always are, most of them are in contact with me. They, they call back and thank me for the advice I gave them. And they, uh, the, the direction that I said, you shouldn't be in this business. You should be doing something completely different, right? And this is because people, again, don't introspect and ask themselves fundamental questions. Do I work in an environment with a lot of people that is very dynamic or I want to be left alone? Some people are, really love the process of self-creation and then they put themselves in the wrong environment and they suffer psychologically. And it comes out in all kinds of weird behaviors and politics and things like that. And if you, if you really understand, again, what we're all trying to achieve, you can see through that and uh, work with someone. And I've moved people around from the weirdest thing, like, in my this this specific organization that I manage right now, uh, I took someone that that managed a program like a program manager, and now he's is is a data analyst. Completely different because it was very easy for me to see that he's attracted to working with numbers and Excel files. He just lights up when mm. when we're talking about numbers. It's like, why don't you do more of this? You know, I'll throw it, some things from other departments at you. Let's see what you do with it. And before you know it, he's like an amazing data analyst. So, um, yeah, those, those, this is kind of the approach I take. I love it. That. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Before we share that one really short, specific action that we always do at the end, what's new and exciting in your horizon, Tal? Oh, um, if you don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I'm, keep I'm, it a secret. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe kind of launching a project of building a museum. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's, that's what's exciting about in my horizon. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no small feat, building a museum. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, well, I look forward to hearing more about it and let me know if yeah, I can help. Yeah. I don't know anything about building museums, but it sounds exciting. <laughs> so what's yeah. one specific action that listeners can take today, tomorrow, this week to upgrade their own ability to lead themselves or lead others, whichever way you want to take it? Buy a notebook, mm -hmm. um, buy a pen, sit down on Friday night, take a quiet hour, and write the question, what is important to me? 
and then start writing. Let your subconscious flow on paper and see what comes out. And that will be the first step in an amazing journey of self-discovery that I think is missing in our culture. And that will lead you to insights of how you can lead better and by just understanding who you are and what, what are the values that are important to you. And it will make you a better person and a better leader, a more authentic leader. Amen yeah. to that. <laughs> so I think people are going to want to learn more from you and about you. What are some of the best places for them to do so on the web, on social yeah. First, I wrote a little book that I think is great to know who I am. It's called Sophie. People can buy it on Amazon. And I uh, mainly use Facebook. I got a, a page that I share my insights, Tal Tifani, T-S-F-A-N-Y. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Okay. Well, we will link to that in the show notes. And hopefully people can... Uh, Get in touch with you. Say hi. Let Tal know that you heard him on the Talent Grow Show. Tal, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank you. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks, you, Lily. All right, Talent Growers, I hope that you got value from this episode and that you found it interesting. I wanted to talk to Tal for so much longer and we probably will bring him back because there's a lot more that he can share about leadership and a little more of the tactical stuff too. But I want to hear what you thought and let me know. I always value your input and your feedback. There's a way that you can leave me a voicemail message right on my website, talentgrow.com. There's a little black tab, whatever device you're using on your computer, on your phone, on your iPad. And that's a great way for you to let me know your thoughts or ask me a question. And if your audio is good enough and you give me permission, I can even use that on a future episode of the Talent Grow Show. And let me know what you want to hear about next, because that is top of mind for me. Well, I really appreciate that you took the time to listen to the Talent Grow Show today. I'm Halelia Zulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.